This might be sort of a cryptic title, and hopefully it'll be made clear uh, as we get started. So before we start, I have a confession to make. It's I like to build my own tools. And many smart and experienced developers will tell you not to do it. And I also think you should not do it, as a rule of thumb. But sometimes I just can't help myself, and I want to write my own framework, or write my own library. And uh, not to rationalize my awful hack jobs, but I do think it's a good way to learn about what you're using and grow as a developer. So today, um, I'm going to talk about a tool that I've built uh, at Call9. This is where I work. Um, we develop a telemedicine service that lets doctors remotely treat emergency patients by the bedside. And it's driven by a web platform with a React front end. And so here's the outline of what we're going to be talking about. One, I'm going to talk about the problem that I attempted to solve, the solution that we've come up with, and then a very cool extension, which will hopefully expose people to something they haven't seen before, which is JavaScript proxies. And uh, feel free to stop me at any time if there are questions. There is going to be code on the screen. If you're near the back, you might want to get close to a screen uh, to really get the most out of this. So what's the problem? Uh, a lot of the front end shops now are running a certain stack, which is React, which you're all familiar with, I would hope. Redux, and can I get a show of hands who's worked with Redux before? OK, almost everyone. Um, and the last technology, which does not have its own swirly logo, so I went ahead and made one for myself, <laughs> is a normalizer. Imagine you're making an application, which is a blog or something. And it's backed by a database with three tables, users, posts, and comments. And comments has foreign keys to posts and users. Posts has foreign key to users. And this is just your, your regular hobbyist uh, you know, project you're working on. You might have an API which looks something like this. So you're making queries, and it'll return a JSON object which has nested elements. So you've got a post at the top level, comments nested in that, and the users for the comments nested in there. Hopefully everyone has seen something like this before. And what Normalizer does is it takes your denormalized data, so this nested JavaScript object, and turns it into normalized data. So it'll extract out each of the different types of objects here and put them in these pseudo tables in your Redux store. Um, they, the nomenclature that they use is entities in the Redux package, or the normalizer package. And so that's what I'll be calling them. So in this example, we have three of these entity tables, posts, users, and comments. Each has a key of the ID, that's the server ID, and then the content in there. Uh, does, that make, uh, does anyone have any questions about this before I move on? Okay, great. Um, so how is this done? When you're using Normalizer, you have to define a schema, much like you have a database schema, which describes the relationship between your tables. You have in your front end a Normalizer schema, which describes the relationships between your objects. And uh, the problem is this. Imagine we're here, we have our normalized data, and we want to display the names of people who have commented first on a user's post. It's sort of contrived for this, but bear with me. So what you might do, uh, you can maybe think of this as a who's following me or something feature. So what would we do? If we have an ID of the users who uh, were trying to display their, their post commenters, uh, we would find the ID of uh, their user ID in the post table. Then we would look at the comments IDs, go look up those IDs in the comments table, then find the user IDs, do another join to the users table, and there we have the names. This is pretty standard fare for someone working on a back-end application and you're doing regular table joins. But in front-end code, naively, this looks pretty messy. Um, so this is how you would implement this if I'm using no other tools but just Redux. And one, it's a lot of code. Uh, it's maybe a little bug-prone, you have more lines. But I think the worst problem is it's really not clear what this does at a glance. If you're working on a team with other developers, being able to quickly see what code is doing is really valuable, and this does not let you do that. So what else could we do? Uh, people may be familiar with Redux, ORM, or Reselect, all great tools. What we're going to be doing is drawing inspiration from another framework, which is Rails. Rails, not a front-end framework. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know what Rails is, I see someone applauding, thank you. Uh, I also think Rails is a great framework. It's for servers, and you can also serve static pages. Um, 
I started working in Rails maybe four years ago, and if I had to give it a, a motto or a slogan, it would be Rails, where things work, but you don't know why. <laughs> uh, anyone who's worked in Rails maybe can relate to this. So the biggest feature, uh, at least for me, in Rails is Active Record, and it lets you write code like this. So if you can't see the screen, it's user.find with an id.post, and you're doing a map to comments.first.user.name. It's very readable, it's pretty clear what it does, uh, however, as a developer who had not come from Rails trying to work on a, a big code base, it's a little confusing at first. You're thinking, um, you know, what, what are these functions doing? Where are, they, where are they defined? They're not in the code base, and Rails does it for you. These are defined implicitly based on how you've set up the models and reading your schema. And so that can be a frustrating or magical moment, depending on who you are. And I want to be able to create that in a Redux application. So. On the left, we have what we could write in Active Record. On the right, we would have what we would write with plain Redux. And what we're going to develop is a tool that lets us write syntax like the Active Record query, but in Redux. So we're going to be able to select our user, call a post function, map through the, the post, call the comments function, and have a much more readable piece of code. I'm getting some, uh, some nods, so I'm going to assume everyone's on board with this. So what is our solution? There's three parts that I'm going to go through. First, we're going to inspect the normalizer schema in the same way Rails would read your database schema, and that'll give us the tools we need to programmatically build these objects. Two, we're going to define the interface, which is what we'll expose to the users to be able to use our query system to make these objects. And three, we're going to get into the real details of how we would build the objects that enable these queries. So first, Let's look at the normalizer schema. If you go into the console and take this file and open up your Chrome console and print out the whole import of this file, it looks like this. So it's a big JSON object, which I have um, recreated for us here. So again, these are three tables. These are the relations. And normalizer represents it like this. So on the left, uh, we have keys, and on the right, we have stuff that's in those keys. And the real internal details of what the, in, the keys are named and whatnot, we don't need to go into. This is more or less what you have access to. Uh, so on the left, I'm going to use some specific names here. If you're reading the code, the names can get a little confusing, so I've annotated them for you. On the far left, the keys have names like post, user, comment. I'm going to call those the entity names. Each of those is associated with a table name, which is the plural, post, users, comments. And each of these has associations, which are the relations that you define. And the association name will be something like author or comments. And the association is a reference to these entities again. So here they are out of the, uh, J the, the console dump that we get, got before. And it's all there. You don't need to understand this entirely. You, you just have to trust me. We can get that data. OK, so inspect the normalizer schema. Done. So defining our interface. For the purposes of this, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what we did before. For each entity, we're going to define two functions, which uh, will be the entire interface to the users of our, our framework. First is a function which takes a single ID, returns a single object. The second is a function which takes an array of IDs, returns an array of objects. So in total, we're going to have six functions at the end of this, and that's all we want. And here's our first temporary implementation. What's going on here? is there's some boilerplate around. I have a function which takes in the normalizer schema as an argument, and we're going to return these selectors that we're going to use. So at the top, this is just grabbing that information that I pointed out earlier. It's grabbing the entity name, the table name, the associations. And the real interesting part here, which is perhaps not that interesting right now, we're defining two functions, one which takes a single ID and simply does a query into the Redux state and returns a JSON object. And the second, which takes an array of IDs, loops through those arrays, and maps them to the first function. So if we use this, well, if we use this as it is, it sort of does what we want to. But as far as our interface goes, these six functions are all we need. And so what would happen if we use this? Here's an example invoking our function that we just wrote, where we would select a post with an ID, and it would just return the JSON object. This is not very exciting. This is what would happen if you're not trying to do, uh, make your own dangerous tool. But um, it's very close to what we want. 
So if we, we can imagine we would just want some function which takes what we have at the top and transforms it into a function which has the same attributes, but the attributes of the author and comments are some function which is gonna return more objects. And it's a function that's gonna take IDs and return objects. This is almost exactly what we just said we were defining before, right? We, we can somehow just have this select based on the ID, then would it just work? And the answer is maybe. Um, so let's try it. Here I'm defining, um, well, this is what we had before. All I need to do is change one function because the plural form is only making calls to the singular form. I'm gonna redefine this function. Uh, it takes maybe eight lines, and all we're doing here is selecting that same JSON object I was talking about before out of the state, making a copy, that's what object.assign does to an empty object, and then looping through the associations and overwriting that value with the selecting, uh, with a function that uses the selector I just defined. And some people might look at this and be worried, or do we have some sort of uh, circular logic here? Are we gonna end up in an infinite loop? And the answer is no. Because we're defining this as an inline function, uh, this doesn't get evaluated when the objects are built. This gets evaluated when you call it. So everything's gonna be fine. So does it work? And it's so close, except we're missing a small detail where I've used the key to, you, to be the index into the, our list of functions, the key being the association name, which is something like author, but we only defined six functions. It was user, users, posts, post, comment, comments. So we have to do a little bit of ugly work to build an object which will allow us to take the association names, author, and give us the entity names, user. So we wanna build an object like this and here's another chunk of code. You, you do not need to understand what's going on here. We're using the normalizer internals to just build that map from author to user. And all we have to do to make our code work is substitute in where we had the key before uh, the, uh, the value out of this hash. And so does it work? This whole thing is about, you know, this is, eight lines and there was that bl block before. Maybe we have 30 lines of code here. And it does work. And it's surprising that this little, little uh, you know, block of code is able to give us powerful syntax where you can see I can select the comment with an ID, gives me the object. I can select that comment and then query for the user and it'll automatically give me that object. And I can arbitrarily call deep nested queries and it behaves just like it's active record. And so uh, we can even go back and write our who comments on my posts function. And so we're done. It seems like we have everything we want. And the last thing I wanna talk about is can we go further? I do not recommend anyone actually use what I'm about to tell you, but it is very cool. And so if we have the time, I think let's take a look. So what are JavaScript proxies and why am I talking about them? I'm gonna start with why I'm talking about them. Bear with me. So this is great. This uh, meets, meets all the needs that I have to use this tool, but could we make it almost identical to Active Record, where I'm not doing function calls, it looks like I'm just doing object reference. And the benefits of this, one, are if you're dealing with an API which gives you normalized data and you have code that is already working on denormalized data, this will work with denormalized data. It's as if you're going, uh, descending into a nested object. And uh, the other reason to do this is it's pretty cool. So what are JavaScript proxies? JavaScript proxies let you intercept and modify functionality that is built into the JavaScript runtime, uh, at least uh, you know, built in before ES6. So now you can modify things like attribute assignment and attribute retrieval. Uh, what does that let you do? It lets you create some incredibly confusing development experiences in general, this is a thing that you should not do lightly. But how do you do it? So uh, if you're using a browser that has ES6 compatibility or, or transpiling down to uh, something that will be able to, yeah, that will transpile this down to plain JS, you have something called new proxy. And proc uh, this takes two arguments, a target, which is the object to be augmented, 
and a handler, which describes the way you're gonna augment the behavior. And the particular way we're gonna augment our behavior in this example is we're gonna use handler.get, which takes two, uh, two arguments, the object that this is being called on and the property being accessed. I think this is way easier to understand in an example. So here is something that will replace all undefined references by the number 42. And you can see I'm just using, I'm defining the get function to say, is this, is this attribute already in the object? If not, return 42. And it works. It's amazingly, it's amazing how so few lines of code can ruin your code base. So <laughs> here's an example of logging out all the accesses on a particular object. And there are a lot of more things you can do with JavaScript proxies. You can intercept assignment as well and do uh, a lot of things like write your own custom validation on objects themselves. The documentation is pretty good. If you Google JavaScript proxies, you'll find some, some cool code. Okay, so how do we use this in our tool? It's remarkably simple. All I'm doing is taking the raw attributes I'd, and replacing the function where we loop through and assigned those elements as functions to be short-circuited using the get handler. And so we have this function, it checks if it's, the key is in the association names. If it is, it uses the exact same line of code we wrote before. And after we write this, it's remarkable, we're writing active record code. This uh, runs in the front end and we can write our uh, queries however we like. So there are some things we didn't cover here. Uh, so uh, what we built at Call9 has a bit more functionality, which we'll probably be open sourcing soon. Um, some things that you might want in this framework, which it doesn't have, is custom model methods, the way you would define model methods in Rails. Uh, you, there's some performance overhead we have when we're defining those functions on each, instanti each instantiation. Uh, single table inheritance, also very cool if you're working with a Rails backend. And you can memoize to go faster. But that is all that I have. The code is all available uh, at my GitHub. So uh, just, I've tried working with uh, proxies before, and just like metaprogramming in general. I, I think, what do you think, like you can use, you know, use it to do a lot of things. Yes. Um, and then have code that, that you like, but no one else can understand. So what do you think is like a good timeline for like when to use metaprogramming and when not using Um It's hard to say. As a rule of thumb, I would recommend generally don't do it if you're working on a team, especially. You, the times we've used metaprogramming are, one, when it's pretty intuitive and simple. You don't wanna do something like I had in the previous slide where you're overriding basic behavior. Uh, extending functionality in an in, in intuitive way and something that'll really save you a lot of time if you think it's worth it. Uh, there's a lot of benefits, but there is the cost that it's harder to onboard new people and people won't understand your code. Um, I think one of the things that I've run into when uh, working with proxies is that uh, it's kind of hard to figure out like, what things are available um, in terms of like, uh, because you can intercept all the messages. You don't necessarily know that that's not available because when you walk out, then it just doesn't show up. Um, did you do anything to uh, be able to actually just like on the objects and stuff? So when you say what methods are available, do you mean like for you to intercept using the proxies or after you've proxied something, what methods are available on that object? Um, I think you can, uh, so the question was, if you proxy an object, how do you know what's available in your new metaprogrammed monster object? And the answer is you sometimes don't if it's written a certain way. I'm not an expert on this, but I'm pretty sure you can uh, as part of the proxying process, also override the, uh, the interface which tells the JavaScript runtime what methods are available. So if you're writing a metaprogrammed library, you should probably update that as well so people can see what's available. Thank you.